pen testing, cloud security, security operations, so many choices. As a beginner, this field can be overwhelming. But don't worry, I'm here to break things down for you. As I've worked across several fields of cybersecurity for the past 10 years. The bottom line is this, Spartans. You may not initially know the best field in cybersecurity for you. And you may never discover it if you settle for your first row. Any guidance I offer in these videos is just that, guidance. And it is always best to speak with someone experienced in the field, to find the area or areas that best align with your personality and interests. During coaching sessions, some of my clients realize that what they thought was a great fit isn't, because the job differs from their expectations. Tailored advice can prevent years of frustration, as you may find out that cybersecurity does not align with your interests after all. For the ones out there seeking general advice, Today I bring you 5 tips to help you decide the best area or areas for you. Let's dive in Spartans. Let's start with the first tip. Get a roadmap. Deciding to go from point A to point B is only half the battle. You need a map showing you how the fields and the roads look like. Here when I mention a roadmap, I'm not talking about certifications, boot camps or degrees to break into the field but simply the various fields of cybersecurity and how they are related. A roadmap like this helps you understand your options and can eliminate areas right from the start. Even if I define each field of cybersecurity, you might still exclude areas you could have enjoyed or excelled in simply because you didn't try them. Expectations often clash with reality. However, being pragmatic with your time is essential, especially if you are choosing the self-taught route. If you follow my channel, you are probably familiar with my previous videos dedicated to mapping out cybersecurity. Go and watch them, once you are done with this video, of course. Not sure which videos I'm referring to? No worries, I got you back. I will make sure to link them in the description, as always. Tip number two, be red or be blue. And yes, I just rhymed. Okay, this isn't a Matrix reference, but in cybersecurity, we tend to categorize each field using one of two categories, red for attackers and blue for defenders. As a kid, I wanted to be a hacker, and once I had my first internet connection, I started downloading hacking materials from peer-to-peer -peer apps like Emule and LimeWire, for the ones that remember. Despite getting my fair share of malware in the process, I realized, or at least I thought, it was what I wanted to do as a full-time job. Fast forward several years and my first job involved offensive security. However, I found out that in offensive security, you tend to spend more time writing reports than actually pwning machines. It turns out that offensive security wasn't my thing after all. Over time, I realized that I preferred building and defending rather than attacking. Now, there are a few key personality traits and questions that you can ask yourself in order to find out whether you sit on the red or blue side of cybersecurity. For instance, are you into coding and building tools? Do you enjoy hardening your own network and your personal devices? This can be traits of a blue teamer. Does running a scan give you a rush? Does finding vulnerabilities or breaking into a machine excite you? Maybe you are a red teamer in the making. Because I've talked about the distinction between red and blue teams on other videos, I will link them in the description and I highly recommend that you check these videos because understanding the divide between red and blue is essential before delving deeper into the field of cybersecurity. Tip number three, be technical or be non-technical. Being a nerd isn't everyone's cup of tea. We all have different preferences. Some enjoy spending hours tinkering with tech, while others prefer a bird's eye view of cybersecurity. There is no right or wrong. In my cybersecurity roadmap video, I mentioned governance, risk and compliance as a field of cybersecurity that is less technical compared to, say, cloud security. The best way to understand where you fit is by combining theory and practice. Some prefer reading over practical experience and not out of laziness. And what I mean by this is that personally, I have to push myself to practice as reading is simply easier and more convenient. But once I'm in the zone, I just love practicing. If you begin with tech by learning a programming language, which I highly recommend and end up despising it, there is a chance that technical roles might not be your thing. And before you start pointing and spouting because of what I just said, I will say that this is not a hard rule. And in order to avoid prematurely dismissing yourself, work on side projects to see if being a tech enthusiast leaves you feeling sour after just a few minutes. And guess what? I have a video on how to choose side projects for red and blue teamers. And as usual,
Generally, people start with heavily technical roles and then progress to more high-level and strategic positions, such as GRC, VP of Security, or perhaps CISO. When I started, I couldn't picture myself as a manager because I wanted to be a techie forever. While I still love tinkering with tech, my mindset changed over the years. And I've been in leadership roles for a while now. I have realized that I enjoy building and leading teams as well as automating security, which is something that I'm currently focusing on. I believe that management becomes inevitable as you become more experienced, because you will be pushed toward it. Refusing to do so can seriously hinder your progress in the field. Beginning with a non-technical position and transitioning to a more hands-on technical role is less frequent, and it's typically pursued in the hopes of getting a higher salary. Red, blue, technical, non-technical. How can I find out on which side do I sit? That is a great question, and the answer is experiment. No amount of YouTube videos and advice from gurus will help you make a sound decision unless you combine what you learn with extensive hours of practice. At the same time, demonstrable practice is what leads you to land a job in the first place. Experimentation is important because it will help you figure out, by trial and error, what areas and tasks attract you the most. It will make it clear whether you tend more towards offensive or defensive roles, and also if you prefer a more technical or non-technical position. Regardless, even if you practice for months, you may still realize that what you thought you liked as a hobby is not something that you like as a job. Jobs don't usually allow as much experimentation and freedom, as at the end of the day, companies have targets and perhaps limited resources. You usually have a job and tasks that need to be finished in a timely manner. And that is something that is quite different from a hobby. As an example, and I've shared this story before in this channel, when I was working at FireEye, I enjoyed reverse engineering applied to malware analysis, as well as blogging about it. However, once I landed a job as a threat research lead at Cisco, where I was supposed to reverse engineer malware on a daily basis, I quickly realized that reverse engineering was not for me. Jobs have a way of ruining hobbies. It is what it is. However, don't get discouraged. You will know you found your niche when you enjoy doing the same thing as both a job and a hobby. And in my case, it took me several years to find the right combination. I have a series on how to break into cybersecurity and two of the videos are about practicing and selling your skills. These two cannot be separated as your time is valuable and everything you do should have public and demonstrable impact. And the fifth and final tip is avoid the rabbit hole. Operating systems was my favorite subject back when I was in university, and I became obsessed with understanding every line and concept present in the course's book. I still remember this one day when I showed up at the end of one of the operating system classes with an A4 sheet written on both sides, with questions and even numbers for pages that left me confused. At the time, the teacher looked at me like I was a weirdo, when I started asking questions because it was clear that he didn't read the entire book and some of my questions were silly and pointless. You see, I have a quiet obsessive personality and at the time I had to understand everything or I would feel incompetent. As a beginner, you may fall into the same trap. There are three things that I've learned over the years regarding books or materials written by someone. The first one is that the authors or author are sometimes wrong. I know it sounds crazy because it's a book, but it can happen. The second thing that I learned is that sometimes books don't have all the information. Remember that the book is simply a book, it's a summary of a body of knowledge. And as a consequence, it's impossible for the author to include everything in the same book, which means that sometimes the missing information could actually explain some of the questions that you may have. The third thing, and probably the most important, is that there are some things that you read on books or even online posts that may not make sense at the time, but will make much more sense later in your life because you simply lack the knowledge. You are expecting yourself to understand everything on the subject that you have just started learning. That will only bring you stress and frustration. When you start, your job is to understand the field at a higher level. As you progress and become more mature in the field, you can and should dive deeper to consolidate your knowledge. If you have an obsessive personality like me, here is a trick for you. If you are reading a book and there is a section that you don't understand and you can't find anyone to explain it to you, simply mark it with a pencil. 
and move on. This trick will offer you some closure because you can always go back in the book and find the places where you had doubts. What you will find out is that what didn't make sense last week, month or perhaps last year will make much more sense later. By obsessing with minutia, you are doing yourself a disservice because you are wasting time and mental energy. Understanding what matters and what doesn't and how deep should you go is something that comes with experience or can be accelerated with the help of a mentor. Avoid wasting time with minutia. You will not understand everything at first and that is totally fine. If there is something that I've learned over the years is that learning for the sake of learning is simply useless. Your knowledge will be solidified through targeted learning based on your needs and also through practice. So don't waste time trying to be a knowledge sponge. And that is all for today, Spartans. Finding your niche is a mix of reading and practicing. Having a mentor can be incredibly helpful, since generic advice doesn't fit everyone. Through coaching many aspiring and existing individuals in this field, I have noticed that each interaction is quite unique, and some end up shifting their initial career plans altogether. Alternatively, without mentoring, it takes several years of personal experimentation based on the tips I've provided before. Given my experience in various cybersecurity fields, I will be sharing videos illustrating my day-to-day -day experiences. In fact, I have already recorded a video on the day-to-day -day life of a threat researcher slash reverse engineer. Don't forget to check the links in the description. Until next time, stay safe, stay paranoid.